history, right in the middle of right now. UK his um, Disability History Month runs from the 22nd of November to the 22nd of December every year. Um, Richard um, is a consultant, writer and trainer on disability equality and inclusive education, which he carries out through the world of Inclusion Limited. Richard is a disabled activist, campaigner, teacher, writer and filmmaker and over the last 30 years has run a wide number of projects aimed at developing inclusion and greater disability equality in the UK and around the world. Through UK Disability History Month, he hopes to develop greater understanding of our struggles against oppression in the past to help achieve equality today and in the future. And Richard's presentation is titled The Social Impact of Impairment and War in the Majority World. So, over to Richard. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by looking at a lip, an area that's neglected. We did have someone speaking about it after Torrington at our launch, but I want to reiterate some of the points that he made. Because it's often thought, uh, when we look at it from the British experience, that this was really a war uh, of the British Tommy versus, and the French with the, the, against the German uh, and so on. And, and in fact, it was a world war because it involved many more areas and countries. And as Neil made very clear, it was about the rivalry between the main empires. It was about industrialisation. But it was also this mass psychology of, of war that he was talking about. And pulled into that through empire, through uh, in Greater India, 1.4 million soldiers were involved in the British war efforts. Uh, a large um, division landed at Marseille and marched up in 1914 to join the Western Front. And they were there for uh, quite a bit of the first battles of, of the war. Uh, and in fact, they were housed when they were injured in Brighton, and Brighton more or less was given over, particularly the Brighton Pavilion, to being the hospital where the Indian Division was actually uh, looked after. And they hired both uh, Hindu and Muslim cooks so that they got the right food. There was a great deal of effort was made to get it right. Uh, they had holy men there as well as uh, Christian uh, padres and so on. Uh, but by uh, the winter of 14-15, of it became clear that these people weren't going to survive very long from the Indian climb, and they got shifted to the war in Palestine uh, and fighting on the front with the Ottomans. Uh, but nevertheless, in that first period, some uh, 47,000 were killed and 65,000 were wounded. And only those who'd been in regular army before got any pension. So those who'd been actually conscripted got no pension, even if they were wounded. So uh, they mainly came from the Punjab, and that's where they went back to. Uh, in Africa, where, again, uh, the British Empire had control, the Cape to Cairo was all pink, if you remember, thanks to sort of uh, blackguards like Cecil Rhodes and others. Um, but they managed to involve 500,000, half a million African uh, personnel, mainly as bearers, uh, but also some, like the uh, Kenyan King's Rifles and so on, which you can see in the bottom picture there practicing, uh, were actually fighting. And so, again, 71,000 dead and 100,000 wounded. The other part of the empire, the West Indies or the Caribbean, uh, they raised a different regiment there, the West Indies Regiment, um, there were at least 15,000 in the first recruitment. Uh, they promptly took them to Canada to train, where it got very cold quite quickly, and a number died before seeing any action of frostbite, uh, because, of course, they didn't have winter uniforms. When they finally got to Britain, they were very little uh, putting them into uh, the front line. But on the other side, Germany had some African uh, colonies, Tanganyika, Namibia, and so on, and there were German soldiers, black soldiers, on the other side. The French also had many of their uh, uh, soldiers from uh, particularly West Africa. And so there were quite a lot of black people fighting on the Western Front, which is often not uh, being thought about so much. What was the impact of this? Well, obviously, to take people out of their cultural environment, uh, out of the environment where they are very much 
seen as subject of empire and uh, the rule was that there were no black officers, they were always only non-enlisted men. Uh, it was a rule throughout the army, though that didn't stop one or two people who were black British making it through the ranks to be officers. Um, but uh, by and large, uh, they remained in subservient positions within uh, going out and fighting. And the impact is clear, although the detailed research hasn't been done, taking a broad brush approach, there were people who fought in the First World War, uh, in the first founding conferences of the African National Congress. There were people who were part of Gandhi's movement for self-emancipation who fought in Europe. Uh, there were people who came from the West Indian Regiment who incidentally, when it was time to the war had finished, they were so worried about the stirring it up that they might do when they got back to the colonies that they were put uh, into Panama and Cuba, away from the areas where, where they might cause some trouble. But nevertheless, a number of those who came through to be part of the movement for colonial freedom from each of those theatres of war uh, played a leading part. So one of the things we learned from that, that the war was not only regressive, it was actually quite progressive in that it educated people who'd been in a very different position about their position vis-a-vis -vis empire to see the realities of the British Empire up close. And that it wasn't invincible because after all if you were surrounded by people being shot and dying everywhere you realised that the white man was not invincible anymore. A second feature that came out of this, which was also a colonial connection, was um, that, and it needs to be said, that the, the officers really of the, of the British Army, the British Expeditionary Force, were cavalry officers. And uh, in Horsfell's book, he, he goes into great detail about this and, and shows that many of the tactical areas that had been made, like both French and Hague, were cavalry officers. And, but this wasn't a cavalry war. This was a war of an industrialised war. And so gentlemen's agreements and the sorts of things that had been done before didn't work and after the first two or three months of cavalry charges against machine guns, we didn't see cavalry charges again. Yet their whole tactics for the last 30 years of the officer corps of the British Army was to fight a completely different war. Now, why was this important? Well, it was important because up until then, the machine gun was never used on other Europeans. It was only used on the natives to put them in their place. Uh, and we see this in films of the Gatling gun, westerns, where we can see often on our screens, if you watch old movies, 200 Comanches being shot at one go by one guy turning the Gatling gun. But no one would ever turn that on other white people. And that was certainly the rule in the colonial situation. But the necessity of the industrialised war, the stalemate, meant that the machine gun came to the fore and it was used... And that was the main reason for most of the casualties. That and the shrapnel, which um, Neil described as burning hot metal, smashing into people, particularly their faces. Uh, and, of course, poison gas. So these were very different things than people were used to, both for the soldiers from the Empire, but also for uh, the soldiers from Europe. Uh, and so I think that's quite interesting that it had that one in uh, effect. Now... Since 1900, there have been 262 wars, most of them since the Second World War, 230 since, uh, since 1945. At a conservative estimate, we've had three estimates of deaths already. Uh, that the most conservative is 78,000 battle, dead battlefield casualties, including civilians, but not those who died subsequently because of famine, because of uh, epidemics like... Many historians think that the epidemic of flu that took place in 1919 was largely so virulent because people had been on such low nutrition for so many years that it could wipe out far more people than, than we expected. Those figures are not included in those, but we've also had a figure of 160 million and 187 million today, so from Roddy, I think. So we've had different figures, but they're all, you know, one, one is double the other. But as I say, this is the most conservative, and you can certainly get up to those figures. But we also need to recognise, as I pointed out for those who were here at the beginning, that for every one soldier or per sea person, or serving person on the battlefield, there are usually many more victims of war, casualties of war, who nothing really have not decided to fight, just their state has decided to do it, and they're the ones who, who get clobbered. Now, I think we had a figure early on in the First World War, it was about 5%, but 
but we're up at 80-90% now uh, of civilian casualties in the wars that we're fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, uh, Vietnam and so on. And that's because, I suppose, the way that war is waged has changed with the high technology. And if you're up against a committed enemy who's ideologically committed, and you have got soldiers who are not, then you have to actually start using any means possible, such, such as Agent Orange that was used throughout Vietnam. And in fact, grandchildren of the people who were sprayed are still having congenital impairments from it. So, you know, that is the cost of war to the majority world. And uh, I want to look at it a bit more because I think it's important for us to see the global context as well as uh, just, you know, the, where we were in Europe. Um, now, the numbers wounded but surviving depends entirely on the availability of medicine, medical treatment, how long it is from when you get your injury to when you actually get to medical treatment, the quality of that medical treatment. It, on average, in the First World War, it was something like 24 hours till you got into a field hospital so that you could have the amputation. Most people were stranded in the mud. The mud was full of uh, pathogens like gangrene and so on, so it would spread very, very quickly. And you'd be far too far gone by uh, 24 hours to, for this to really affect you very much. But nevertheless, so there was only 36% of those who, who had casualty in the First World War uh, who actually died of their wounds. So that means that nearly two, two thirds were, were, health, were surviving. <coughs> so we're talking, at the conservative estimate, of these wars, these 262 wars, about half a billion people have been directly affected. And then there are others who we heard about, someone asked the question about refugees and displacement, we heard some figures earlier about that. And of course we're also picking up figures I want to look at a bit later on the effect of mental trauma on the population as a whole, which is running between 10 and 20%, 20% recently measured in Sudan, where there's a recent war. So we're actually talking perhaps uh, more, far more than 500 uh, million we may be talking about a billion plus. So war is extremely wasteful uh, and difficult for people. It's extremely profitable for those people who actually manufacture the armaments and the powers that be. So that we have this contradiction which I think has come more and more to the fore in, in recent years. I pointed out this morning <coughs> when uh, Neil was speaking that it was interesting that Nearly all the wars that we've had, and that's the bulk of them, 230 wars, uh, have been on the periphery. If we see the world divided up into the core area of where uh, capital is really generated and where it's controlled from, and the periphery, which is the majority of the world, uh, that those wars are in the periphery. But we also know that the wars are resourced and uh, supported by those in the core. So just pick it up this slide. So in the US Civil War, which if you like was one of the first mass wars where, which went on for four years, 56% uh, uh, of people who got injured died. It was the first war where there was organized uh, ambulances to get people off the front and into the, the surgery. But nevertheless, it took a, quite a long time. By the First World War, as I said, we were down to 36%. Uh, and that, these are American figures, that's the very low figures because the Americans didn't come into this till late 1917 uh, on the ground. World War II for the Americans was, uh, again they came in much later than, than other European powers, but uh, their rate there was 37%, so it hadn't actually improved despite the fact that they had various antibiotics that they could use, uh, x-rays, blood transfusion, which was first used in the Spanish Civil War. So battlefield medicine had improved considerably, but still only 37%, uh, uh, well, so 37% were, were dying as opposed to 36% in, in uh, the First World War. But when we get to Vietnam, and before that, I haven't got time to go into it, we had the Korean War, and some of you may remember MASH, the Mobile Field Hospital, uh, that was a huge innovation that the helicopter could pick people up and bring them in and so many more people survived. Uh, and that also went on in Vietnam. 
But then when we get to the three last wars that the Americans have fought, the, the two Iraq wars and Afghanistan, those dying from injury are between 8 and 13 percent. What does this mean in terms of war veterans? Well, it means there are many more, proportionately, war veterans coming back from each of these wars, not necessarily in global numbers, but as a proportion, than there would be. So 450 British soldiers died in Afghanistan, but that means more than 5,000, probably, uh, if we took a 10% figure, and it's probably higher than that, probably 15,000, coming back with serious injury uh, and joining the ranks of, of disabled people. So... That's quite interesting, and I think those pictures that people have seen is, is an imperative to actually try and develop a, a war from certainly the, the rich powers where people aren't put in that position. So we see the uh, remote control war with the drone attack coming in more and more because governments are very sensitive to the now much higher profile of the anti-war movement around the world. Uh, and so they think if they can keep the casualties down by using drones, that it won't be so unpopular. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. But some pictures around this of the improved uh, military medicine. And interestingly enough, uh, in Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital, just up the road there on Houston Road, uh, it was entirely run by women doctors and entirely dealing with male uh, combatants who were bringing back nearly all the hospitals in London because it was quite close to France uh, were turned over to the, to military casualties. Um, but some of the other things that we see there. Now, this is too difficult to read, so I'm going to read some of it out. This is just, I couldn't take the list of 230, so I took the number of wars that were still going on from 2000 onwards just to give us a feeling of how much is still going on. And I'll read a section of it. So, uh, sectarian conflict in African Republic, 2099. Uh, South Sudan Civil War, 1755. Uh, Syrian Civil War in 2011-13, uh, not the latest. Uh, we haven't got the figures for the ISIS-inspired uh, part of that. 43,000. Uh, and these are all the same figures, battlefield casualties, so they're not really giving us the full picture of what's going on. And some of the bigger ones here, like the <coughs> Sudan versus the militias at 1983 to 2013, nearly 100,000. Uh, the Mozambique government versus Frelimo and Renamo, 115,000. Uh, Ethiopian government, 76 to 2013, 23,000. Uh, Tamil Tigers versus the Sri Lankan government, I think that's 70, 73,000. Overall, just from these wars, since which were going on before 2000 or still went on into this new century, there were nearly 2 million dead directly. But what I want to argue, is, and that would mean in, if our figure of one third uh, uh, dying of those who were injured, then that would mean something like 6 million disabled people. So that's a big impact on all these low-income countries and where there's little, if any, uh, support in terms of welfare uh, or medical provision. And so, in many ways, war in the current period is far more of a problem for the periphery countries of the world than it is in the, the metropolitan capitals of, of, of the core. And nowhere is that shown more clearly than the ordinance that has been left in the ground uh, in, in these places by combatants. The landmines that have been left, 110 million were estimated when the landmine treaty, land treaty came in, and perhaps they've removed 20, to 20 million, a, pot, a really big uh, guess that that would be, I think it's probably far less than that, which would mean that there would still be uh, well, nearly 100 million ordinances left in the world. One of the good things that's happened since that treaty is most combatants are not using them in the way they were before, and particularly scatter bombs that are just lie on the ground. But there's enough of them out there to still have a steady effect on people, and the numbers kill 15,000 down and 20 uh, to 20,000 when the land ban treaty came in. The figure we're at now. Uh, is 4,000 a year, 
is still, as these are mainly women and children working the land <coughs> or playing, uh, it's still a major issue of the social impact of war. And these are wars that many of the peace treaties were signed years and years and years ago, and it's still having an impact. And so although we've had the treaty, we shouldn't forget that this is still a big issue that's going on. The one that I want to spend a bit more time on, it seems to me, and this is my view, and different people have different views, but I'm looking at the literature and reading things. Over the last hundred years, rape and sexual abuse of women and children has moved from being seen as part of the spoils of war to being a generalised weapon of war. And I think much more research needs to be done on this, but that's certainly the impression one gets by reading reports on a whole number of wars. Amnesty International in their report, Lives Blown Apart, which I would recommend, this phenomenon is chronicle, survivors face emotional torment, psychological damage, physical injuries, disease, social ostracism, and many other consequences that devastate their lives. Um, women's lives and their bodies have, have been the unacknowledged casualties of war for too long. Uh, now, Angelina Jolie and her unlikely ally, William Haig, co-hosted an international conference on this earlier this year, which I think it's important that uh, it drew people's attention to this. And certainly, in the wars that we've been fighting in the last 30 years, rape seems to have been for, we haven't been fighting all of them, rape seems to become much more generalised. Now, the impact of this is trauma, as well as if you actually have the physical de uh, de devastation on you. And I think one of the things we need to think about in, in war, when people are totted up the costs of it, is that this is another uh, major cost. And what this does, it means for half of humanity, they are treated in the ultimate sexist way by being abused and losing their humanity by just becoming an object for the soldiers. Object of gratification for the soldiers, and often not even for gratification, but to impose their culture or their uh, dominance on the other culture. And I think it's something that, that needs to be more thought about when people talk about war, because I think it's an important part of the impact of war on the majority there. Now, the shame of war, the sexual violence to women, a common characteristic to many conflicts, as I've said, is this. Um, Few of today's wars are international conflicts fought exclusively between professional national armies. They almost, you look at the war that's going on in northern Nigeria with Boko Haram, already nearly 5,000 people killed. Very often women and children are targeted there uh, almost exclusively. Uh, and so the, this weapon of war is a reinforcement of sexist divisions within society. Uh, Already, 137 UN countries have said they're committed to phasing this out, but it's one thing, as we all know, to side up to say they're going to phase it out. It's another thing to actually stop it. The other long-term effect uh, which, we, which war has is just if a war is going on all around you, uh, you have to move, you have to look after your family, your children, you have to try and save the objects that are most valuable to you or if your life is threatened, you just abandon them and move. And huge numbers of people having the long-term effects of this. We've got two studies that have been done recently. One in Northern Ireland, after the 30 years of troubles there, showed that 10% of the population had symptoms of um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And a study that was done in, in South Sudan, using similar indicators, after five decades of war, found that in a sample of the population of adults, 20% uh, had post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that's one-fifth of the population. And the effect of that on people is that their ability to regenerate after war is actually much less. And of course the biggest impact on all of this, war is about destruction. It's about destruction of people's livelihoods and it leads to people not having food, to famine, uh, and to dislocation, uh, and that leads to large numbers of children not having schooling, even when we've battled over the last 30 years in many parts of the world to get children into school, the war immediately destroys all of that. And uh, one that I was involved with last year in South Sudan, most of the schools were shut most of last year in five of the ten provinces because of the war. And that's not a particularly high level war that's going on now, it's just between warring factions of the government. So. Looking now, standing back with those thoughts in, in mind, this is the world's wealth in uh, 2008.
2000. Uh, it slightly changes if you draw the countries proportionate to their wealth. We've got big growth there, India and China, and Japan and Korea about the same. So this is in 2010. Now, there is a direct link between the wealth gathering activities of those large countries and the wars that are taking place in all the other countries. It is a global phenomenon. It isn't something that just happens. It, it is something that is encouraged. People are selling the armaments. And who are the countries that are selling armaments? 30% of the world armaments comes from the United States. 4% uh, from Britain. 24% from Russia and growing. It's gone up from 22% a few years ago. So carving out sphere influence. Germany, 9% uh, and France, 8%. Notice China is an importer of weapons, it's not an exporter of weapons at the moment, though no doubt it will try and change its position on that, as all empire building powers will do. Against this, what have we got to put against it? Well, we've got the United Nations framework, which was set up after the Second World War, just as the League of Nations has been set up after the First World War, so there would never be a war again. Well, it hasn't been very successful if we've had 230 wars in the period since the UN has been running things. But nevertheless, some progress has been made on uh, conventions, conventions on the rights of women, conventions on the rights of children, conventions on the rights of disabled people, uh, and convention on the rights of black ethnic minority uh, people in their countries. Uh, indigenous people and so on, uh, as well as social, economic and political freedoms. Uh, and so our best hope, it seems to me, is not the weak methods of the UN, but to actually ensure that each country buys into it and invests in the UN in a way that will actually work and is bound by the agreements, unlike uh, Britain going to war in 2001 against UN agreements. Uh, so, you know, all countries need to abide by this. They then need to work with combined to eradicate uh, those who are seeking to uh, use means other than the ballot box to overthrow uh, <coughs> democracy. But democracy has many guises, and often what's called democracy is autocratic dictatorship. So there are problems with any such bland statement. Nevertheless, it seems that the world this year is looking at how it can actually develop a sustainable green future where there is a quality for all. Now, it may be a pipe dream, but if one can combine the millions and millions of young people and others who will, for instance, be mobilised on one issue around uh, ecological issues, as happened in, in September, some 20 million people, uh, as anti-war demonstrations, 30 million, and so on. The new technology that we have does actually break down some of the barriers of power, but it's about how we actually use it. And interestingly, I think someone asked, well, why are there so many more refugees? It may well be that in Africa even now, 90% of people can actually be in touch with a mobile phone. So if you hear an atrocity in the next village, you're going to hear about it much more quickly, so you're more likely to move away. So again, another area where we can look at it. So that's perhaps the negative impact of the new technology, or perhaps a positive if it's saving you and your family. But in a way that the old statesmen could actually just do this in private and have their own wars, I think we're getting into a new period where we can actually have some optimism that by the majority of people joining up and, t and standing on principles of humanity, human rights, anti-war, and for a sustainable future, there is a way forward. But I would admit that it's pretty pessimistic as we look at our television news any one day. But nevertheless, as it has always been, we've been in a contradictory position as human beings. And so my result, as I say, it's a personal view, is never doubt, as Margaret Mead, the uh, anthropologist, said, that a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So if you take that idea, plus environmental and economic crisis, the internet and social movements, it is possible to have hope and to move forward to a new world order based on sustainable futures and principles of equality. So I wanted to leave us on a, a better note. Thank you to Richard for 
a very informative um, Disability History Month. Um, the launch was fantastic a couple of weeks ago and today. And for all the hard work Richard's put into today in organising the conference, speakers, I think, a round of applause for all of you. Thanks to Paul for chairing so angrily as well. Yeah. <laughs> well I don't particularly want people to discuss what I said, you can make comments. In. Let's have a general discussion yeah. in the last part of the Yeah, we've of this. got the last 20 minutes just open up to the floor for a general discussion. So just if I take you in groups of three, if you want to raise your hand for any comments or thoughts you want to put it there and then maybe yeah. And then Mike after you, so maybe there. I am Richard. I just wanted to ask what definition of war um, you use, because I don't. Well, most statistics. Yeah, because I don't know whether um, northern Nigeria would actually fall into that that definition, and certain. Well, I suspect that Palestine and Israel wouldn't. But it does on, on those statistics. Right. It's any, anywhere where there's more than a thousand battlefield casualties okay. in, in a particular theatre of war is the definition that this is using. Oh, but as I say, it leaves out a large number of the civilians who may also be affected. Yeah. Mm. But that, that's just one I found, mm. and they seem to be arguing it from a quite conservative point of view. So rather than have, as uh, who was it, our Chancellor said, the BBC was doing hyperbolic. Uh, Statistics. I wanted to be very much on the on the conservative side to show that we still have a huge issue here to deal with. So that's where I get statistics from. Mandy, yeah, my, my question is um, around sort of the actual, you know, the, the actual UK disability history month. Because what you've done, Richard, is over these last five years, is actually get get off the ground, off the ground, the, the idea that sort of was floating about. And in terms of how do you think it can really develop traction in, in the years years to come? Because you know, Black History Month and LGBT History Month started with just a few individuals that just decided to get a hold of it. And and if, as far as schools are concerned, you know, Black History Month is there now. I mean, it might just be around slavery, you know, in sort of two hundred years ago, but it's but it's it's got traction. I mean, LGBT History Month. It, it's patchy, isn't it, in the schools? And, and as far as 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 UK the disability industry is concerned, it's it still tends to be again it, it's patchy. There's more there's more assemblies and things going on, and there's, and, and as more and more of the material comes out, it begins to get a bit more in the, in the ordinary curriculum. But what, how how do you think it can get a bit more? Traction? Well, LGBT History Month benefited greatly from a buying by the government. Um, given our commitment to the social model, I'm not sure the current government will buy into it. They, they do have on their website saying that they support the social model, but everything they do seems to go against it. So uh, I, I'm not sure about that. So what I've tried to do is concentrate on affiliation from the teachers' unions. So we've got the NAS, UWT, NUT and UCU have all been partners in this from the beginning, although they don't do enough. They have all taken initiatives to get stuff out there. We This year we concentrated on trying to make alliance with the wider trade union, so we linked up with Unite, the biggest trade union, with 1.4 million members, uh, and they have run a whole series of events with their members around the country, and uh, they pay, pay for the broadsheet and the launch. Next year, as I say, I want to go down a different one. We were looking to the media, we we're looking at the NUJ, the equity, we we're looking to film makers or was it BAF, I saw or something like that. You yeah. BAF, uh, I can't back remember that. Is it BAF? BAF 2, BAF 2, thank you. And BAF 2, but I'm also looking that this year we've had about 10 councils, which is more than we've had in other years, so Cambridgeshire, Croydon, Southwark, Lambeth, Hackney, uh, Manchester, actually Manchester Council put out a whole series of things that they're doing, which I think you had quite a lot to do with. I have been... I've I've been deciding it. I've been I've been deciding it for the past months. I'm 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 so, I'm so when I was to talking about the 
next year to set it up as a, a community interest company so that at least we can get grants and so on because we're missing out on grant from Heritage Lottery who have already offered us several grants but only when we actually have a formal thing. I don't particularly want to set it up as a great big council of people because I have a lot of experience of setting up such things and then they become a real problem. But I think it would be nice to have once or twice a year people who are interested who want to shape the direction to come together and say, yes, we, we need to go in this direction, we need to do that. But it's, it's just, it was actually the founder of the LGBT History Month who said to me, isn't it about time, Richard, you set up a disability history month? So I said, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll do it and we'll see how it goes. And I think we're now, it's at least half embedded. I think we've got a, a long way to still go in the next five years to get it so that everybody knows about it and that the, the, uh, the quality press at least will run articles during the month and so on which we're not getting yet but they do on LGBT and Black History Month. So good question but that's where we're going and I hope that our next year's theme will be more populist in some ways because it can affect everyone. Moving image, uh, journalist, uh, portrayal, portrayal in art, portrayal on vases in the British Museum, you know, however we've been portrayed throughout human history is really the theme, so there's plenty of scope. Uh, Mike. Yes, I mean, I, thank you. I, mean, I, I think that's the problem, actually. It, it, it gains some uh, traction or some momentum in the, in the public arena, that would be excellent. And I think there's, there's allies in the LGBT and the uh, Black History Month movements who will help with that process. But if you look at the kind of media stories that there are around, for example, today, with Disabled Go, whoever they are, um, doing their survey on accessibility and surprise surprise all these places are inaccessible and if only they went to disabled go and paid the consultancy fee they could find out how to do it better and it's all over the today program nothing to do with our politics nothing to do with our history all to do with you know uh, you know how much money we can we can spend in capitalist uh, uh, companies that's all it is and you know there's a real missing element there for our politics that um, it, it reflects a wider you know, drop back in the movement, I think. But anyway, to, to come to the, the point I wanted to, to, to raise, which is really about, um, uh, I, I think that there's an interesting message that we're getting, to, as I'll illustrate uh, very quickly, in terms of war veterans in this country, um, about, you know, that the, the feeds into this kind of worthy and unworthy uh, disabled person, who actually all end up getting treated the same anyway, incidentally, but we're well, not quite, but almost. That I heard of, there's a whole thing blew up about two months ago about how the NHS is part of the military covenant and how as part of the military covenant disabled people who are injured through war ought to really get first dibs on the best treatment um, ought to get the latest technology, the best treatment uh, be put at the front of the queue because they are, and it was almost said directly, not quite all but though the worthy disabled and the, and the complaint and the whole centre of the debate was why aren't these people getting treated better 
not why aren't disabled people getting treated better, why aren't the, you know, why are these queues so appalling, why is the treatment so bad, but why, never mind everybody else, what about these poor, worthy disabled people who have been injured in war, who really ought to be treated better than, uh, than they are being doing, who are having to wait, you know, for 18 months or two years for mental health treatment or for physical impact, treatment for their physical impairments and so on, or, that, or, or they get immediate treatment and then get discharged and dumped in the rest of the community, just like all the rest of the crypts, and it really isn't on, you know. And that was the tone or the fulcrum of the debate. And it's very interesting um, in terms of how that feeds into all the stuff around war about the worthy and the unworthy disabled person. Yes, thank you. I agree with that. I mean, we're not big enough to challenge that on the Today programme. No. I hope no. within five years we could field speakers no. because I think it needs to be challenged when it comes up. Uh, we also need to make common cause with those organisations of war veterans. Uh, I tried to get involved, veterans against the war in this, and they said, no, no, we only deal with ex-soldiers, we're not interested in disabled people, so we've got some way to go there with them, uh, you know. I just want to feed into your comment there, Mike. Um, many veterans with mental health impairments are literally told in the NHS, in the mental health services, that they're combat stress, post-traumatic stress, because of war, are too specialised for the NHS to treat and half the time are never treated by the NHS because it's too specialised for them to treat and they get told, as I was, go back to the MOD and ask for counselling and of course with over 30 years of cuts in the support services for the MOD for veterans, you can't get that psychological help and when you've been made redundant, you can't then get access to then the veterans hospitals that you used to because most of them have now gone. With cuts to the NHS, with privatisation of services, you're seeing a lot of services now being rationed, i.e. steroid injections, pain injections, um, really access to specialised treatment, especially in the community with uh, you know, support services and everything being cut, yeah? And, you know, at the end of the day, I don't like to make distinctions between disabled veterans and disabled people because we all struggle on a day-to-day -day people. And the thing is, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, yeah? And the thing is, we do need to come together as a movement. There's no them and us. We're all being affected by what's happening here in this country then we're all being affected by what's happening in this country now and the thing is it's how do we raise our voices how do we come together and how do we fight back because if we don't and there's all this division and animosity we are going to get what pretty damn big time and we're only going to see what's going to come next year because next year you've got the better care fund which is coming in in april when george osborne says about three billion he's putting in the nhs yeah? He's taking three billion out of the NHS to pay the Better Care Fund. The Better Care Fund money is a divisional pot of money going to each area which the Health and Wellbeing um, Boards are getting. They're going to decide which community service gets that little bit of pot of money. And if that community service in the NHS doesn't get that pot of money, it goes. The Health and Social Care Act is coming and the Care Act. And I'll tell you something now, we haven't seen anything yet because social care is being ripped apart. 78% of councils only give critical care needs support. Now, and we've got the ILF ruling on Monday, which I have to say to all of you, if you're around on Monday, 10 o'clock, Royal Courts of Justice, when that judgment is being given, please come down to the Royal Courts. This has been such a long fight for the independent living. If they make that decision to close, we continue to fly. But what that will mean, if they, if they close that fund in June, it's a devastating, I can't even begin to tell you. It will put people into residential homes quicker than that. And you've got personal independence payments. Eight out of ten current DLA recipients fearing being imprisoned in their own homes, unable to work. Slashing of access to work support. They want us to work. Where is the support for us to do it? Where is it? They're taking it. They are taking the support. And we've got a lot of work to do. And universal credit is going to affect over 
three quarters of a million disabled people who are going to lose money, which they're rolling out in February next year. So people who are coming up for a work capability assessment next year will be put through universal credit. And that needs to be recognised and thought of. Peter, can I have yours and then Roddy, I think? Okay, uh, I'm not sure what to say next because I was so impressed on what you just uh, uh -huh. said. So it, it were just a couple of comments with regard to your presentation, mm -hmm. uh, Richard. So yeah. First of all, uh, uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the fact that rape is more and more used as, as uh, a weapon within wars. And you definitely are right to say that most of the victims are children and, and women. Uh, but I recently organized a conference on silence and gender. And one of the presenters, uh, she gave a talk on rape of male soldiers, which is a huge taboo until now. And I think that gender aspect is also worth mentioning uh, when you were talking about, about rape. So that, that was my first comment. And then my, my second comment is actually, uh, it's something that worries me. Uh, because when I, I'm looking towards all those numbers, actually I have to admit that those numbers, they do not touch me. I cannot cross them. They are so entangled. And I'm just wondering if we want to create change. Is that the right way to do it? Or do we have to search for alternatives? I mean, they of course say something, the numbers. Uh, they, they say how big the issue is. But do we really reach the persons who we want to reach with those numbers? I, it's just a question. I'm not sure how it works with, with the other people attending uh, this conference. But. So that was my second uh, comment. And my third suggestion was when I look at our Disability Film Festival, uh, in one week uh, we kind of reach 1,000 visitors, which is, I think, a, a huge uh, success. And I think that is partly due to the fact that we closely work together with organizations of and for persons with disabilities on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, we try to reach student population in Kayoluvin. So we try to embed it in the curriculum of the university uh, studies. So that is just a suggestion. Maybe you can try that in one of the of the next uh, edition of the Disability Extreme. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, Peter, and Richard brought up about the United Nations. This government here in the UK are the first government in the world to face the United Nations inquiry for the human rights abuses of disabled people. They've broken the UN Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities. And the report, they've delayed the report until after the election next year. What we've launched now is Operation Disabled Vote two weeks ago to encourage disabled people to register to vote, to, to know the different ways of voting, to have hustings, to get involved in the election. Because when we win in court, which we have, the government rewrite the law and carry on regardless, no matter what we do, no matter how we do it, they are just steamrolling over everything here. They're denying people food, money to money to just to live. People are going months with no money. They're being evicted in droves and evictions in throughout the UK are going up. Rough sleeping in London this year alone has gone up 64%. Yeah? And it is absolutely appalling. I mean, homeless veterans and a police officer told me this down at the House of Parliament. They put homeless veterans, made sure that they were nowhere near Remembrance Sunday a couple of weeks ago. They cleared them out like vermin. They gave to their country and they were treated like shit. Excuse my language, but there we go. And I remember doing a project last year and I spent four or five days in London speaking to homeless veterans and I've got some very powerful black and white images people of vets who served in the Falklands, the first Gulf War, in Afghanistan, who were made redundant, who have nothing at all to live on, who were treated appallingly, who've got combat stress, PTSD, schizophrenia, a wide range of mental health parents, and a few with physical impairments who are out there right now in freezing conditions who've got nothing. And nobody's doing anything about that. 
and that's something that needs to be addressed. What's happening here in this country is a global thing. You look at disabled people in other countries where things are happening with cuts and what have you. The assisted dying, what's happening in Holland, with one in three are being killed without consent, where disabled children have now brought in euthanizing as being legal. They want to bring that in here. And it's an appalling situation that's going on now. We do have to fight. And we do need everyone to come together. And it's hard to take body if you can ask them to say. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree with all that. I mean, obviously, the, the worse austerity gets, the more vile the voices it starts to get raised. You know, the likes of UKIP and all the rest there, who, you know, seem to get away with saying just about anything that they, they want to say. Um, about disabled people getting smashed against windows and all that kind of stuff is quite acceptable and that kind of But the point I wanted to make really is about, uh, just to come back to what Mike said earlier, because um, Mike missed the discussion this morning so I'm not going to go back over it again, but the thing about uh, you know, the deserving poor and so on, war veterans deserving poor, David Cameron said last year that disabled veterans should be exempt from the test to transfer people over from disability living allowance to the new uh, personal independence payment mm -hmm. on the basis that you know why should they have to go through what, uh, what others do, civilians do, as he puts it. And again that very much refers back to the whole thing about disabled veterans being uh, more deserving than anybody else and all the rest of it. But of course, you know, as Paul has just said, that's uh, it's propaganda, nothing to do with the reality of the situation. And when they promote winded warriors or whatever the latest cause is, it doesn't change the social situation of the vast majority of disabled veterans whatsoever. Uh, all it does is, uh, is, is, is hold forth the idea that something's getting done about it. And I do think that we, we should question this term, you know, all the time being used about uh, disabled veterans being heroes, right? Because the thing about it is it's not, it's not about saying they're not. It's about saying, to me, it's about excluding all the other people who's providing generally for public services, whether it's nurses or firefighters and all these kind of people who are facing big cuts at the moment, which is actually about saving lives and not taking lives. And these are the people who are having their services cut at the moment. So I think that the point is I'm making is in general, you know, these people want to make our society a lot nastier and more brutish for, you know, the majority of us. And I think that we have all got to find common cause and all these issues that are about defending public services and making alliances with people that are